Uh, welcome to Getting Started in Hardware Reversing with ZDI. I am Vincent Lee. Uh, this will be today's outline. Um, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you would have gained enough knowledge and confidence to start your own hardware reversing adventure. So a little bit about myself, uh, I am a vulnerability researcher at the Zero Day Initiative of Trend Micro. Uh, I am mostly responsible for the hardware cases that come through our bug bounty programs. Um, so with that, let's head straight into hardware reversing. So to find vulnerabilities in IoT devices, routers, or other embedded devices, uh, you can follow uh, these high-level steps. First, you need to obtain the firmware, and the easiest way to do that is to go to the vendor website and download it uh, if it's available. Um, but sometimes some devices, uh, some embedded devices, their vendors do not provide that on their website. And if that's the situation, you have to go through the hardware route uh, by reading the flash chip directly uh, via e either JTAG or uh, interacting with the flash chip directly by desoldering it and use uh, flash RAM, flash ROM to read, read, up, read out the firmware. Uh, with the firmware extracted or downloaded, we need to uh, extract the file system within the firmware uh, to further analyze the programs uh, that the firmware runs. Uh, and to do that, we can use Spinwalk and there are plenty of articles online that explains how uh, one would use Spinwalk. So we're not going to talk about this in this presentation. And uh, now that we have all the files extracted, um, you could uh, start analyzing the programs, the surfaces, and you can do that either dynamically or statically. Uh, with static analysis, you can put the program into your favorite disassembler uh, and then just start, hard, uh, start reversing to uh, look for vulnerabilities. And um, so today's talk, we're going to focus more on the dy dynamic an analysis part of uh, the vulnerability hunting process. <clears throat> With dynamic analysis, you want to achieve two things. You want to get shell or you, and the debugger. Uh, and you can approach this from the software side or the hardware side. Uh, from the software side, uh, uh, the easiest way to get a shell would be to say go to the router settings page and try to enable SSH or Telnet service and then get a shell from there. And from from there, you could uh, set up a debugger. Uh, with a shell, you could set up a debugger. Uh, and if your firmware runs on some sort of uh, Linux variants, you could try emulating it with uh, Kimu. And uh, there are also many uh, two other Keymove emulation, Keymove-based emulation frameworks out there called Fermadin and Armix. Um, on the hardware side of things, uh, things get a little bit interesting. Uh, you don't necessarily need a shell to gain debugger access. Uh, we're gonna focus more on the hardware side today. Um, so to get a shell from the hardware, uh, we can use something called UART. Uh, also known as the zero sh shell. And to gain a debugger access on the hardware side, uh, we use something called JTAG along with OpenOCD. Excuse me. And um, so obviously we cannot go through all the details uh, in this short pr presentation today. Uh, if you're interested in any of these techniques, you can uh, read one of the blog posts that I've written to uh, for a more in-depth walkthrough of how you might want to, uh, how you might uh, approach uh, these analysis options. So in software vulnerability hunting, you want to be familiar with different protocols such as TCP, TSL, HTTP, uh, FTP, just to name a few. And it's the same with hardware vulnerability research. You want to be familiar with uh, these at least these five protocols. Um, we're gonna talk, uh, go through JTAG and UART today. And then SPI and I2C are uh, used to communicate with peripheral devices uh, that interacts with the main CPU. And then CAN is a bus protocol that is mostly used in automotive applications. So if you want to say hack a Tesla, uh, that will be the protocol that you need to learn 
Uh, with that said, uh, this is let's go to our today's first target, which is the Belkin Surf N300 router. Um, this device is a really old device and it does not run on Linux. It actually runs on a real-time OS, uh, RTOS Supertask. This is an internal view of the device. Um, so in, you can see in the middle, uh, we have a Rawlink SOC with a MIPS core. And then to the left of it, it's a e-tron tech RAM. And then there, underneath the metal shield, it is some uh, analog uh, amplifiers for the uh, Wi-Fi antennas. This is the back of the PCB. And this is the flash chip that stores our firmware. So say the vendor uh, does not provide the firmware on the website, you will have to interact with this chip uh, to extract the firmware. Um, so uh, to gain debugger access, um, we use something called uh, JTAG, which stands for Joint Test Action Group. It is designed to test if all connections are made properly at the factory. So it's a very powerful uh, protocol that allows uh, the testing device to connect to all the pins on the chip. Uh, and all these pins can be read or written. Um, so with this protocol, that's how you could uh, communicate with the flash device to uh, dump out the RAM, uh, dump out the firmware without desoldering it. Um, you, uh, the JTAG also provides a debugging, debugging interface that allows uh, the testing device to read and write to the RAM and the registers and set breakpoints on the CPU. So to use this protocol, we need uh, five pins, uh, which, are t which is listed on the first line, TCK, TMS, TDO, TDI, and T TRST, which stands for uh, test clock, test mode select, test data out, test data in, and not test reset. Uh, uh, this protocol is a synchronous serial interface. That's why we have a clock uh, signal. Uh, so on the PCB, you might want to locate, uh, look for at least a one by five header, or sometimes depending on the CPU architecture, you might want to look for a two by five, two point seven, two by seven, or two by eight, uh, two by ten pin header. And these uh, pin header sizes are uh, dependent on the CPU architecture. So, say for example, with ARM, you might want to look for a two by ten uh, header. With MIPS, you might want to look for a two by seven, which we have in the picture on the right of the slide. And um, to locate this header or these pins, uh, we could do that by uh, reading the data sheet if, it, if it's available. And uh, if not, we will need to uh, go to the PCB and try to brute force all these uh, pinouts. If you're interested in learning more about how to locate the JTAG header, I, I highly recommend the locating JTAG pins automatically presentation by Hans. Uh, he has a great presentation on uh, the details of how to uh, do exactly that. Uh, this is the data sheet for the Rowlink SOC. SOC stands for System on Chip. So uh, a large part of hardware vulnerability research involves reading the data sheet. Uh, it is a wealth of information and there is no point in looking for JTAG header on the PCB if the if the data sheet does not say it supports it. So on the slide in the red box, we can see that uh, it says it actually supports JTAG and uh, I square C SPI and various other protocols. And if we look further into the data sheet documentation, we can see that in the pinout diagrams. Uh, in the red boxes, it has uh, kindly labeled the uh, JTAG pinouts. And if we locate those pins and follow the traces, that will lead us straight to the uh, JTAG header on the PCB. Uh, more data sheet. This is another uh, page from the data sheet. It shows a high level function, functional block diagram of the SOC. And you can see that it has uh, 
support for I square C, I square S, SPI, and uh, various other uh, interfaces. So on this same router, uh, it also has something called uh, UART, which stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. Uh, asynchronous, asynchronous meaning that uh, this protocol does not requ require a clock signal. Uh, that's why it only needs uh, technically two pins, uh, RX and TX, which stands for receive and transmit. So to look for this, again, read the data sheet or look for one by two or one by four pin headers on the PCB and then try them out. <coughs> so uh, open OCD. So you have a JTAG interface. You found the JTAG interface. What do you do with it? Uh, you need something called Open OCD to interact with uh, the JTAG interface. Uh, it stands for on-chip debugging. It taps into that JTAG uh, debugging interface to uh, de debug the uh, CPU. Uh, it is the lowest possible level of debugging and it has the full control of the device. Uh, to do that, you need the JTAG interface. You, you need a JTAG programmer and uh, and some uh, <laughs> time and effort, and then hopefully uh, very soon you get a working JTAG-based debugger. So this is the JTAG debugger that uh, I used for this router. It's from Bus Blast. It's from Dangerous Prototype called the uh, Bus Blaster. Uh, you can use any other JTAG debugger. Uh, they are all very similar, and o Open OCD supports uh, most of them. So with that, um, this is how you would uh, set up Open OCD. Uh, you require, you need two uh, configuration files. Uh, the first one being uh, dpbusblaster.cfg. It is provided by the uh, vendor of the JTAG debugger programmer. So uh, dangerous. This is uh, from Dangerous Prototype. And then you want to have a second configuration file called the um, that is CPU dependent, and that changes depending on your target. Um, this um, so this is the contents of the RT three five zero two, which is the uh, serial of the chip, and um, so with Open OCD uh, in this configuration file, it defines that it will start two services, uh, a telnet service and a GDB server. Um, and um, it also changes the clock speed of the CPU to 500 kilohertz. And um, it has many other options um, that provides uh, a very powerful uh, uh, debugging interface. So. Uh, Check, check the documentation to uh, see what you can do with uh, OpenOCD. And um, you want to be, be careful with this configura configuration file as uh, with the wrong commands in this configuration file can uh, break your device. So uh, you want to proceed with caution with this. Um, so this is a screenshot of a successful OpenOCD uh, connection launch. Uh, this to get to this page, like this screenshot alone, it actually took me a couple of weeks with helps from a lot of people. So uh, don't give up if you don't get to uh, this screen in like the first two hours of trying uh, hardware reversing. So more screenshots. Uh, in here we, we can see on the leftmost uh, terminal, it's the original Open OCD connection. And then in the middle, it's the Telnet session that allows you to interact with the OpenOCD software. And then on the right, uh, it's a terminal that uh, that uh, that shows the status of the GDB server that you can later attach to with a GDB client and to interact with the uh, target or the CPU. Uh, this is our second uh, target of today. Uh, it's the TP-Link router. Uh, it's also another N300 router. Uh, 
It is a much newer device. It is also very cheap. It's only $20 US. Uh, so if you want to get started in hardware vulnerability research, this is the router to start in. Uh, you won't necessarily uh, cry over it if you brick it or destroy it. Again, this is the internal view of the router. Uh, we can see that it has, uh, in the middle, it has a MediaTek SoC. To the left of it, it's uh, Zentel RAM. And then on the right in here, that's the Giga device flash. Uh, again, this is the uh, data sheet for the MediaTek device. And again, we can see that it supports both JTAG and UART and various other uh, protocols. And then there's the functional block diagram on the bottom. So uh, on this device, uh, the PCB designer has nicely labeled the uh, UART interface on it. Uh, so we just need to solder some jumper headers on it to uh, start interacting with the UART interface and get a shell prompt. Um, so you have the, the UART interface. You also need something called a USB to serial uh, cable or USB to UART cable. Uh, there are two variants of it. There is a 3.3 volt or a 5 volt uh, flavor to the cable. Uh, so make sure you get the correct uh, flavor for your device. Or you could use a logic level shifter to shift the uh, voltage level from 3.3 to and, and 5. Uh, you could build one with uh, transistors and resistors, or you could buy one online. Uh, so all these uh, USB to UART cables are all FTDI-based chips. It, uh, it it translates the USB signal into UART signal. Uh, so any, uh, any of these devices should work. So you want to uh, hook up the cable to the interface and then you need something uh, like PuTTY to connect to the serial terminal. And you need to set one very important uh, parameter, which is the uh, baud rate. Uh, on the slide, we have a uh, common standard baud rates. And I believe the one, uh, 115,000 uh, is the most common uh, baud rate. Uh, so you could uh, start with that. And if your device runs on some really obscure, weird, non-standard uh, bot rate, you might have to uh, use an oscilloscope and look into the uh, clock frequency and, and deduce the uh, bot rate from there. So uh, then we, we will have a shell once we hit enter. And in here, if we browse around, we'll notice that we have a MIPS 24 uh, MIPS core, uh, 24KC family. Um, so since these embedded devices have a really limited sort of storage, it actually provides very few commands com compared to a standard uh, Linux uh, distribution or a standard Linux box. So uh, to get away with, with this limited storage, uh, the embedded device developers use something called BusyBox. Uh, BusyBox is a collection of Linux utilities that is size optimized and, and uh, jam packed in one package. Uh, it's very common in, in uh, embedded devices. And uh, you could uh, get pre-compiled binaries from uh, their website and then um, uh, and you can uh, load it onto your device to get a more um, more fully featured uh, shell. So to do that, we need to determine a writable location on a device. So with the mount command, we see that uh, we can write to the RAM FS. So we use a TFTP server to transfer uh, these uh, tools onto the device. So as you can see, we moved uh, both BusyBox and GDB server onto the device. And with that done, uh, we have 
much uh, many more commands available to us and then we can also use the uh, pre-compiled uh, statically compiled gdb server to uh, run uh, debugger instance So uh, let's look at some vulnerabilities in, in these routers. So the first one is uh, in Belkin Surf N300. It's a stack buffer overflow. So this is the POC that uh, triggers the vulnerability. Uh, as you can see, uh, this vulnerability exists in the UPnP service uh, and UPnP is uh, SOAP protocol based. So we can see that in the um, SOAP envelope or uh, within the soap payload um, the get specific port entry action and the new port property uh, there is a stack buffer overflow vulnerability there if the new protocol is a very long string it will crash the the router uh, this is the control flow diagram of the vulnerability of the uh, vulnerable surface and all the pink boxes are actually vulnerable string copy calls. So, uh, so in this diagram, we have three stack overflow, stack buffer overflow vulnerabilities. Um, we zoom in a little bit more, and we can see that um, this is um, this is the vulnerable string copy. Uh, in MIPS, there's something called uh, a delay slot where the instruction after a branch instruction also gets executed. So in here, we can see that um, uh, string, uh, the vulnerable buffer, uh, stack buffer is uh, stored into the A0 register. And then the A1 uh, source buffer uh, is stored into the vulnerable uh, the vulnerable stack buffer is stored into A0, and then the uh, attacker controlled uh, buffer is stored into uh, A1 uh, from S S0. So uh, once when the CPU executes the JL instruction that branches to string copy, it will also execute this uh, load word instruction following it. So uh, let's set up uh, OpenOCD and uh, GDB and put a breakpoint there and see what happens. So uh, we, as we can see, we put a hardware breakpoint at that look, uh, that instruction, and then we continue with the GDB uh, debugging session. And here we have uh, hit the breakpoint. And uh, as we can see, uh, A0, where the uh, vulnerable stack buffer is, is uh, at this location. And then since we're still at the JL instruction, uh, the A1 register hasn't been set, but it came from S0. So we can see that uh, S0 has this instruction. So let's dump those out. And uh, in a destination buffer, we can see that uh, it only accommodates a few bytes. And on the um, attacker controlled buffer, uh, we're giving it a giant wall of ace and if we uh, further continue we'll get a sec fault and a crash so uh, we can see that the uh, the instruction pointer is overwritten and uh, the stack buff the destination buffer is also overflown so uh, in here uh, this device has a um, no ASLR, uh, the stack is also executable. So to exploit this, it is very straightforward. We just need to uh, uh, overwrite the PC address with a shellcode address, and then we'll have code execution uh, very easily. So uh, that's it. <laughs> so wrapping up. So I guess when you're stuck uh, on so hardware vulnerability research is not easy. And when you're stuck, I guess, uh, think back to the OSI reference model uh, in, a, in a network situation. Uh, you want to uh, 
uh, if your internet's not working, you want to make sure that you have the cables connected properly. You want to make sure your router is turned on. You want to make sure you actually paid an internet cable provider to get internet. So you want to uh, think in terms of layers and uh, try to start from the very bottom. Make sure you have uh, connected the wires properly. Uh, and then from there, you want to check if the, if the protocols are talking is running properly if if the devices are actually talking UART properly or JTAG properly. Um, in that, you also want to test from uh, test the components individually. Um, so uh, I guess one advice is to work from a known working component to a non work non working component. So say with the UART serial shell, you know your computer works. And then you can start debugging and testing the uh, UART cable, uh, which, which, so with uh, you want, on the UART cable, you can do something called a loopback test. If you short the RX and TX pins on the cable and use PuTTY to connect, you should uh, see the keystrokes appear on the terminal. And once you've determined that the UART cable works, you can you can uh, try to work on the uh, work on getting the UART interface to work with the router. So working from the the com laptop to the cable to the router, that's how you troubleshoot uh, various uh, scenarios, and that's uh, really my advice on what to do when you're stuck. So uh, with that, uh, that's the end of my presentation. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And uh, I guess it's question time. <laughs> thank you.